Animation is really a 19th century uh, invention. Uh, movies are also, and we, you know, we look today at electronics, but no, everything then was gears and uh, sprocket holes, and it was very mechanical, it's things you could fix with a screwdriver. The first real animation device came out of Belgium. It was a phenakistoscope. It was a disc with slits on the side and a series of pictures running around the disc, and you spun it, and you could hold it up to a mirror, and you look through the slits, and it looked like it was moving. And then that was converted to the zoetrope, which was a drum which slots around the side and you put a strip of pictures in it and twirl it and you look through the slits and you saw the pictures moving. And the flip book, then you flip pages, those are all a series of cycles that really, you know, nobody could look at that and say this is going to be an industry someday. But it wasn't until uh, Edison and the Dixon in New Jersey developed a kinetoscope where they could run a minute of motion picture film, That's what they developed from Eastman's transparent film stock. Uh, and you could see something that was a little more continuous. It was the Lumiere brothers in uh, France who decided to project the pictures on the wall. That's around late 1895. That's why they feel movies started around then because to project it on the wall made it an audience thing, and that's the movies. Animation, I think, even began before the Winsor McCays and all the early stuff. We go back to Edward Muybridge when he was photographing animals in motion, trying to understand the business of what each frame sees when something moves. Maybridge took individual shots of a, a racehorse moving in this famous sequence to prove that the racehorse actually kept four feet off the ground at one time. They never really knew whether it did it move, move so fast. Um, but with the moving images, you could, you could stop it and tell. I'm kind of a purist. I think that animation existed well before film. The marriage with film worked very well, of course. Film was just the kind of uh, engine that sort of let you get the animation out. Animation evolved from the old vaudeville lightning sketch acts. Cartoonists would get up on a stage and talk and create a drawing as they were talking. And sometimes they would do like the simple trick of turning a baby into an old man. Like, here's youth to old age, and they would just age the character one line at a time, and that would get a gasp from the audience. You know, the more you look at ancient stuff, it seems really dowdy and, and really rooted in the vaudeville and, and minstrel shows, and it's full of really vulgar humor and racist and, and, and things that are really make you kind of uncomfortable, uh, anti-Semitic uh, jokes and uh, stuff like that. But, it reminds you that that animation had its origins in a really rough and tumble world where you had to get a laugh or you were out of there. Well, probably the best known early animator is J. Stuart Blackton. And he worked for his own company, Vitagraph, and did these short films as just a kind of uh, lark, it seems. Blackton, who was working in 1906, came up with the idea of one crank, one frame one crank, one frame. And he made a, a picture called Humorous Phases of Funny Faces, which is just drawn on a chalkboard. Again, it's the lightning sketch, but his hand isn't there. And it appears that the drawing is drawing itself because it was added one frame at a time. And that was the first time anybody had put a drawing drawing itself on film. That film had a tremendous influence on everybody after that. Everybody was doing a modification of that idea in some way or another. Characters drawing themselves, interacting with live action, all that kind of stuff, all came from Blackness film. And one of the people who was a specialist in the Lightning Sketch Act was Windsor McKay. McKay was an all-around popular entertainer, but primarily he was a cartoonist for the Hearst newspapers and he had an arrangement that would let him go on the vaudeville stage once in a while and present lightning sketch acts. Winsor McKay really popularized animation, was the first one to do that. He's called the father of American animation, inspired a whole generation. But he was a showman. He was a vaudeville performer before he even got into animation, vaudeville performer and a comic strip artist. So he combined those two things. As a vaudeville performer, he appeared on the bill with, uh, with W.C. Fields and Harry Houdini and Will Rogers. Winsor McKay was a master draftsman and artist, and no one, I think I can say safely, no one has ever approached what he did on a newspaper page. When you look at the original Little Nemo and Slumberland cartoons, which filled a gigantic newspaper page, his imagination, as well as his skill at 
rendering these drawings are just mind-blowing. He was a bona fide genius. He started doing animation as a kind of experiment and a novelty. That's how he saw it. He saw it as an extension of what he was doing for, for newspapers, uh, not as a career. McKay's first film was uh, an adaptation of his comic strip, Little Nemo in Slumberland. Uh, it was called Little Nemo, it was uh, made in 1911. And it's quite amazing because it really takes all the detailing that was in the comic strip and brings it to the screen. And people were uh, quite befuddled by it. They thought that what they were seeing were real people up there, real actors. And you get this influence in uh, McKay's animated films, which have this extraordinary emphasis, uh, sometimes humorously, on the actual means of production. And you see workmen rolling in giant barrels of ink and enormous bales of paper. And when you compare McKay to earlier practitioners like J. Stuart Blackton or Emil Cole, Blackton and Cole would, would emphasize the magic. You know, how is it done? They're leaving you with all this wonderment. Whereas McKay, you know, does it on a kind of materialist basis. People are, are betting him uh, that he can't make a, a cartoon image move. And so he takes the bet, and then you see him working in the studio, and uh, you actually see the apparatus by which he, he tests the animation. It's like this giant flip book. The images are rotated on a cylinder so he can check the movement. And then he shows you one of the frozen images, watch me move, you know, written on it. And then it comes to life, but you know the process you know, by which it's done. So McKay really dealt with the primacy of the artist and this heightened convention of, of uh, the image. The second film he made was called How a Mosquito Operates, and that was from 1912. To me, it's the beginning of personality animation. He has certain attitudes, he, uh, the way he approaches his, his work, if you will, he sharpens his uh, long proboscis on a wheel. He's full of interest in what he's doing and very fastidious. You start to imply personality traits in this little character. It's pretty horrifying, actually, because the mosquito is a very large mosquito, and it, as it draws blood out of its sleeping victim, its body swells with the blood, and it's not, it's not just like a balloon filling up with water. You have a sense in McKay's drawings that there's an actual structure to this mosquito's body, and that structure is reflected in the way it swells and enlarges as it gorges itself in blood. That was one of the scariest films I've ever seen, and that film, because of the detail and almost the beauty of the, the drawing and the fineness of it, it's really my nightmare of, of insects. It's very beautiful, but it's very creepy. One important film that Windsor McKay has always been known for is Gertie the Dinosaur. And Gertie has, depending on which print you look at and the projection speed, about 10 minutes of animation. Uh, again, we don't know exactly when work began, but it probably took about two years to get it done. He didn't use printed backgrounds or cells, and so he retraced all his backgrounds, which uh, gives the film one perspective, what might be a kind of crude quality. Uh, the lines are kind of wavy and wiggly in the backgrounds a lot. But uh, from another perspective, they're really vibrant and really alive. In his films, he became quite adept at recycling frames. When Gertie shifts back and forth, we really feel her weight, feel gravity pulling on her. Those cards are recycled. That was one of the ways that McKay got around this labor-intensive challenge that animation presented. This dinosaur moves variously like a, a large animal of a, a, an animal of other kinds. It gets, it's playful like a cat, for example. And it capt captures this sort of movement very convincingly in this dinosaur's movement. It makes it real, makes it convincing by finding ways to suggest other animals through its movements. Gertie doesn't really have any traditional orthogonal receding lines, but it does have receding perspective in the lines of the bank of the lake behind her. Also, some perspective when Gertie throws the woolly mammoth over her shoulder and he or she flies back and lands in the, the water. So he uses perspective tricks like that. This is something that will be developed by animators for the next two or three decades, and that is visualizing the scene as though it were being filmed by a camera in real time and real space. You know, he was so concerned about 
having people believe in what he was drawing. He wanted, like Disney, he wanted you to believe in the characters. He wanted you to think it was a real dinosaur in a real world. The Sinking of the Lusitania by McKay is recreation of the Sinking of the Lusitania, an animated recreation, something that there were no cameras present, so it was something that was in demand, something that he had an urge to create, and something that really shocked and moved audiences to see. It's actually a documentary, a cartoon documentary of the thinking of Lusitania, and it's very detailed and very beautiful. He used cells there, I think, for the first time, and you can tell the intricacy of all the details, and it makes it a little more of a propaganda film almost. The somber feeling that he got into it, the almost sentient quality to this ship that is wounded and then, uh, you know, goes down so slowly in these agonizing death throes. I mean, you feel almost a, a personality coming out of the boat. It's an incredible, incredible film. When the ship is going down, we see the hapless victims falling and jumping off, and it kind of looks forward to Titanic many decades later as the, the ship goes down. He's trying to make a point, so he uses the sentimental shot of a mother and her child going under the water uh, as part of the, the, the climax of the film. It's uh, really quite a moving film, even today. In fact, there's no reason to believe that animation would follow the hand-drawn uh, template. It could have gone in any direction. There was all types of animation. You had uh, stop-motion things, like puppet films, and but you also had live action films that used stop motion objects. The thing about early cinema is they didn't have the, the computer generated uh, special effects that we have today or even bad, they didn't even use back screen. So these guys had to achieve this somehow, you know, visually. A lot of times uh, to achieve a visual gag, especially comedy films, incorporate an animation. And the earliest one I've seen is the Max Sennett produced Keystone film titled The Bowling Match. But you see Ford Sterling, who's, uh, you know, a braggart, and, and to have revenge on him, they set up some contrived electronic device. And then when he throws the ball, they cut to the animation of the ball chasing the pins around. There's all kinds of early movie effects. And then you had the art, experimental art films, where people were using cutouts and other little techniques that did show in theaters. Well, certainly in somebody like uh, Emil Cole, for instance, he used various forms to create a fantastical stream of consciousness effect. And the British pioneer, Walter R. Booth, even brought hand puppets into the mix. In Europe, they were using similar techniques, but mostly uh, for abstract films. My favorite, I think, was an entomologist, actually, from Russia named uh, Starovich, who animated bugs. At first, actually, he started, he tried to use real bugs and animate those by photographing them one after another, and they didn't cooperate, I guess, too, too well. So he created these, I guess you'd call them puppets because they, they, they're, they're man-made constructions, but they look exactly like the insects. And these elaborate stories, he, he was, unlike some of the other Europeans working, he, he was into the story, and he had these, these great stories um, that, that he told through these animated bugs, and they look just beautiful. The sense of social caricature is so strong because you have these bugs that are um, enacting an adulterous story and a hypocritical one at that. You have Mr. and Mrs. Beetle and she is unfaithful and he gets very upset except he's being unfaithful at the same time. I'm more intrigued in, in the adult animation than stuff for kids. I mean, that was fantastic the animation in that, with all the little beetles, and, uh, and it was also, it, it kind of said something, <laughs> an interesting message. <laughs> Willis O'Brien is another favorite of mine, uh, partly because he made the first animated King Kong, but before that he made sh shorts leading up to some of his fully rendered animated films, and there's no reason not to call them animated films, even though they were puppet, they were clearly, clearly puppets, but they were certainly animation. O'Brien's was different because it, his type of animation was not stylized to the point uh, they were characters in a story rather than uh, puppets for the sake of being animated puppets. I preferred the O'Brien technique. He always had a single figure that was jointed and then you would manipulate it and you could put character and so much more into it. The 
animation industry, if it's to succeed, has to be part of the broader film industry. And in the teens, the industry was moving toward a format that called for a new feature film to be released every week. Distributors had to, give, had to send out a reel with novelties on it. They had to have probably a live action short comedy, a news of the week, and a cartoon. They expected it every couple of weeks. You had to fulfill that, otherwise you couldn't be in business. Windsor McKay didn't even conceive of the idea of uh, the assembly line system that came to be the way animation was, was executed by, by most studios. So when J.R. Bray and Earl Hurd got involved with animation, they too had newspaper backgrounds, but they quickly came to understand the need for output that you had to be able to turn these out on a regular basis if you were gonna make any kind of living in animation. By the mid-teens, you have animation starting to metamorphose into something that's more industrial. And that is facilitated by this patent of John Randolph Bray and Earl Hurd for the cell technology. In fact, it was one of those paradigm-shifting innovations. And essentially, the use of cells breaks the animation image into two elements, foreground and background. So the, the, uh, the PEG system and, the, and, and cells were the two primary inventions that made it much easier to get these out faster, more quickly, with better fluidity. In fact, for a long time, for decades, uh, everybody in animation was paying them a patent fee. It must have been revolutionary to figure out that you could find a way to just draw the background once and have your character move across it through a piece of clear celluloid. Bray and McKay were rivals, and McKay sued Bray for stealing his patent, and then Bray countersued McKay for stealing the patent. And this went on for years and years. John Randolph Bray, around, uh, I believe it's 1913, creates a character named Colonel He's a Liar. And uh, Colonel He's a Liar becomes the first serial character, the first regularly appearing cartoon character in animation history. And Colonel He's a Liar was a uh, diminutive man, some say inspired by Teddy Roosevelt. He looks like Teddy Roosevelt, so that's where it came from, but when you see what the stories are and the movements, I mean, him playing baseball and what have you, it doesn't, there's no pl politics in the, in, in the animation, so I, I, I tend to not think so. He does look like him, if you, if you just go on the, on the face of it. Colonel He's a Liar was a, a tall tale spinner caught up in outrageous situations. The, the inner titles on the films are usually rhyming couplets that tell uh, Colonel He's a Liar's stories, and we see the outrageous uh, tall tales acted out uh, in animation. There were dozens and dozens of them, uh, and as the series went on, sometimes stopped and started and went on, I think, for at least 10 years. I really like Earl Hurt's Bobby Bumps cartoons. I think they're, they're really ingenious and imaginative. Uh, and you see Earl Hurd playing with the medium itself, actually devising ideas that in some cases no one had ever thought of before. In many of the Bobby Bumps cartoons, we see the hand of the artist, which I believe was Earl Hurd's hand, coming in and interacting and moving the, moving the characters around and being a kind of a god over Bobby Bumps and his dog. He also thought of the same kind of thing that the, the Fleischers were doing, uh, with a little bit of live action, where he had Bobby, which was a, a cutout, sitting on the animator's hand as he was inking the animation drawing. I know that was a, a, a leftover device from Windsor McKay, like, let's see how the artist uh, creates animated drawings. And it was really, you know, a holdover from the public kind of needing to understand what they were about to watch. Bobby Bumps puts a beanery on the bum, takes place in a restaurant, where Bobby and his dog create all kinds of havoc, smashing dishes and so forth. And the intervening hand of the artist uh, draws for them a ladder to escape the increasingly chaotic situation. In order to keep 
anybody from chasing Bobby Bumps and his dog up the ladder, the artist erases the bottom of the ladder. The cartoon ends with Bobby Bumps and his dog suspended in the middle of nowhere on this ladder, a kind of uh, very existential and surreal ending for its time. I think these cartoons in many ways preceded the Fleischer and the Coco the Clown cartoons. Animation was very, very closely tied to newspaper comic strips for about five or six years. And at that point, it was very much a newspaper-driven culture where everybody read like nine newspapers a day and comic strips were very big. And it, it would make sense that early animation would have close ties with newspaper comic strips. In 1913, Emile Cole came to New York from France to direct The Newlyweds, which was based on George McManus's comic strip that was very popular just for one year. And sadly, 1914, the whole lab caught fire, nitrate fire. Every negative was destroyed. There's only one of those that survived today, and that be was because somebody had a print somewhere else that they preserved. But that was the first time they took uh, a comic strip character and made a series out of it. There's one very pragmatic and mundane reason why so many comic strip characters came to the screen, and the answer is William Randolph Hearst, because Hearst, the newspaper magnate, the publishing giant that he was, owned King Features Syndicate, which owned all of these popular comic strip characters. And Hearst was interested in movies right away, and he started a newsreel in the teens, and he also decided to start an animation studio. And if he was gonna own an animation studio, it only made sense to use the characters he already owned as the stars. The most noteworthy is probably a sequence of Crazy Cat cartoons. They really pale by comparison to the original George Harriman comic strip, which is brilliant and wild and surreal and, and graphically very interesting. The uh, drawing styles in all of these films aren't particularly ambitious. They were by the number factory assembly line cartoons. Some were forgettable, some were amusing. I was pretty much disappointed most of the time by the adaptations of the comic strips through animation. Uh, Crazy Cat as a comic strip is one of my all-time favorites. They've never captured that really. I mean, they had no consideration of what the original strip looked like. There are some of the Crazy Cat films, some of the Cats and Jammer kids films that are inspired, uh, and some that just have a kind of workmanlike feel to them. If a, a comic strip like Mutt and Jeff, which is syndicated in, say, over 100 newspapers, this, it has this kind of built-in audience already. People recognize the characters. They will go and see a Mutt and Jeff cartoon. They were done at the Raoul Barre Studios, and the person responsible for drawing, uh, animating, and directing most of the Mutt and Jeff cartoons was a man named Charles Bowers, or Charlie Bowers as we know him today. Charlie Bowers and uh, Raoul Barre and some of the early uh, animators were trying to animate in a sort of a, a, a sporadic way. They hadn't really studied action very much yet. Animation was in such an early stage that nobody really related looking at real things and the way real things move and caricaturing it. There's one Mutt and Jeff cartoon that we've preserved at Eastman House called Domestic Difficulties, which is a typical night on the town with Mutt and Jeff. They're sneaking off away from their wives to go out drinking. There's a, a nice little stylistic touch in it. The backgrounds do a, almost a 180 degree effect that takes the audience to uh, Mutt and Jeff's drunken revelry in the park. And also, at the same time, this, the kind of spinning gives you a sense of their inebriation. The backgrounds are spinning around. That's a clever little uh, device. There were probably more Mutt and Jeff cartoons made than any of the other screen adaptations of popular comic strip characters. And I think at one point, they were able to produce one a week. So it was almost the equivalent of a Sunday color supplement. Martin Jeff comic strip, every week you would get a new 35 millimeter Mutt and Jeff short film. Max and Dave Fleischer were working on 
the rotoscope, which is the, the technological entry that they had into the animation business. Max had seen animated films, had read technical articles about animated films, but thought that most of them were awkward and stilted uh, in their depiction of movement. It's a much more realistic type of animation. And even people who don't like the so-called rotoscope style will applaud some of the scenes in uh, the cartoons. I love rotoscope, and I, it's been bad mouth for a, a lot of people to dismiss it as, as, a, as a, uh, a crutch as for people who can't draw, and I totally disagree. I think good rotoscope is a delight to watch. But Max kind of discovered that breakthrough. You know, let's shoot a live actor and base what we do on that performance. The animated clown was filmed from live action footage of Dave Fleischer, who was filmed in front of a white sheet wearing the clown outfit that he used in his job in Coney Island when he was a teenager. You would see Max at a drawing board, and he would be seated there or sometimes standing there, and he would take his pen and start to draw Coco. And usually something would interrupt him or there would be some sort of interaction between him and the drawing. In this case, uh, in Tantalizing Fly, for instance, a fly comes as he's drawing Coco and makes him flub his, his drawing. At one point, the clown tears through the paper and dives uh, through the tear. And Max picks up the paper and turns it over and you see the back of Coco going down. And he then just takes him in lets him be reabsorbed into the inkwell. Towards the end of the teens, there are two characters who emerge that would dominate most of 20s short cartoon filmmaking. The one is Coco, the clown, and the other is Felix the cat, who uh, began life uh, with Otto Mesmer at Pat Sullivan's studios. So he came up with this little cat, and his name was Master Tom in the first one. And then he just took off from there. Paramount distributed one, and it was so popular that it ran for many years. It ran up, up, up till 1931. The first Felix cartoon, or what was to become Felix, uh, was called Feline Follies. And you can already see in this rather crude Felix germs of what would make him a star. He is variously looking for romance uh, or a, a, a place to stay or food to eat. Uh, kind of ties into the other enduringly popular character of the era, which is Chaplin's Little Tramp. Felix looks directly at the camera, very Chaplin-esque like. He makes contact with the audience like an old vaudevillian. He hears a meow, and so he questions it by having his tail detach and make a question mark. And then he scrambles off into the distance. At another point, he plays a couple of notes on the guitar, and the notes come out, and he takes the notes and turns them into two scooters, one for him and one for his girlfriend, and they go off. He's the first completely uh, credible uh, pen and ink creation that you really want to see sustain more than a single film, that you want to really see go on you know, from film to film to film. So much of what I see in animation today is a direct response to the last generation's animated cartoons. It's clear to me that animation is building on a foundation one story at a time. You can't be reinventing the wheel every time you start a new film. It makes sense to have a continuing character. This character will also develop a certain personality. In the Fleischer studio, you have Coco the Clown, eventually Betty Boop, eventually Popeye comes in. The baton just gets passed from one innovation to the next. The technology to do animation really uh, evolved simultaneously with the craft of animation and the principles of movement. And all of these films are the roadmap to that. And it's, it's why they're worth you know, en enjoying and studying to this day. Mm -hmm.